Welcome to A Journey Through the Message. My name is Robert. My name is Heidi. And we are both excited to have you along on this journey today with us. I am so glad to be here. I always get excited for your intro because you come in with a really welcome. To, and I'm like, I obviously can't do it. And I'm like, oh, he sounds so good on the radio. And oh then here I come. <laughs> Oh, friends, thank you for putting up with us. I just looked and we finished Genesis. We did. We have one complete book of the Bible out of the way already. I don't know if out of the way. That sounds a little bit like it was in the way. No, We've it wasn't in the way. One We've gone book through of the Bible one already. whole book of the Bible. I was just giving you a hard time. I knew what you meant. It's and it has been interesting just mm -hmm. reading through Genesis and spending some time in it and seeing all of the different families and their yes. drama. And the one thing that I took from it is that even though we may have advanced in such great mm. ways with technology, yep. human nature just hasn't changed a whole lot. It has stayed exactly the same way. People are still stealing birthrights. It just looks like something different. And yes. people are still cheating and Conniving, conniving, scheming, murdering. All of it. There's no difference in the Old Testament humanity and humanity now. We just have it all wrapped up in a more modern look. Version. But yeah. I certainly wouldn't say that we're any better. Kind of like we put lipstick on a pig? Ba kind of. Okay. Kind of. I would think so. It just so. looks a little different. I think people are almost even more boldly defiant in the face of God. I think there was a general sense and belief in a God, maybe not necessarily the one true God, but cultures all had gods in religion that was deeply important to yes. them. Yeah. And I think society today is becoming increasingly a society that says we don't need one. We have ourselves. And from what I'm seeing around in society, that doesn't seem to be working out really well. I think that people have just changed their gods from a religious type of god to maybe something, let's say it's gaming or let's say it's alcoholism. Let's pursuit say it's of wealth. Pursuit of wealth. Fame. Could be a lot of different things that it looks like now. And it has replaced the pursuit of religion, whether it was an idol from Baal or some of these other idols. I think the idol of choice has become self. Hmm. That we are so selfish. Thinking of ourselves wanting more, thinking we have to have more in order to have the label success on us and completely missing, as we heard last time, what is right in front of your face? Yeah, that is the tough one. So, Father God, be with us. Open our eyes today as we read through the Bible. Open our minds and hearts to be receptive to the words. Speak to us in the way that you know how. You know our language. You know the language of our hearts. Mm -hmm. Before anything is ever even spoken out of our mouth, you know what's inside of us. So just bless us today as we go through this and be with the people that are listening today. Be with them in their own special way. And wh whoever it is that's out there that just needs yes. a little bit of encouragement, you can make it through this next day. We promise you God's there. We're there. Just encourage them as they go through this day. Amen to that. So, Father God, thanks for being you and giving us this opportunity. I ask this all in your holy name, I pray. Amen. Amen. All right, so we're kind of back on a normal reading schedule here. We are, if you call what we do normal. Yep, that's exactly what we're doing. Heidi will be picking up in Matthew, and I'll have all of the text, as usual, written down in the comments below. So if you want to follow along in your favorite translation, that's kind of our whole intent here is to get you to pick up your Bible. Yeah, just open it up and get in the Word. I have to say... Genesis has become something completely different to me. I think it was just something that's way back in the Old Testament, and it's a creation story. Sure. That's just the opening Just the tip act. of the iceberg. It's, it's just remarkable. So I'm just going to challenge you. For me, it was finding this paraphrase, and whatever it is for you, 
I'm going to encourage you to do it. There's something about being excited about this. God just opens your mind and heart and you mm. see things, hear things and receive things. In a different it, way. Yes. Yeah. Yes. All right. Here we go. Starting at verse 21. When people realize it is the living God you are presenting and not some idol that makes them feel good, they are going to turn on you, even people in your own family. There is a great irony here, proclaiming so much love, experiencing so much hate. But don't quit. Don't cave in. It is all well worth it in the end. It is not success you are after in such times, but survival. Be survivors. Before you've run out of options, the Son of Man will have arrived. A student doesn't get a better desk than her teacher. A laborer doesn't make more money than his boss. Be content, pleased even, when you, my students, my harvest hands, get the same treatment I get. If they call me the master, dung face, what can the workers expect? So is that like the greatest insult back in that time to call someone dung face? I, don't, I mean, it's <laughs> kind of offensive. It, it, <laughs> no, it is. I know. We have it. It continues today. We sure. use a different word than dung, but yeah. I just, it's yeah. humorous to me to see yeah. that. Don't be intimidated. Eventually, everything is going to be out in the open and everyone will know how things really are. So don't hesitate to go public now seems like we're hearing a lot about that don't hesitate. Mm. Don't be bluffed into silence by the threats of bullies. There's nothing they can do to your soul, your core being. Amen. Save your fear for God who holds your entire life, body and soul, in his hands. What's the price of a pet canary? Some loose change, right? And God cares what happens to it even more than you do. He pays even greater attention to you, down to the last detail, even numbering the hairs on your head. So don't be intimidated by all this bully talk. You're worth more than a million canaries. Stand up for me against world opinion, and I'll stand up for you before my Father in heaven. Ho! Ho! That's to say that one again. Wow. Stand up for me against world opinion, and I'll stand up for you before my Father in heaven. I just had chills thinking about that. Wow. If you turn tail and run, do you think I'll cover for you? Don't think I've come to make life cozy. I've come to cut, make a sharp knife cut between son and father, daughter and mother, bride and mother-in-law. Cut through these cozy domestic arrangements and free you for God. Well-meaning family members can be your worst enemies. Mm. If you prefer father or mother over me, you don't deserve me. If you prefer son or daughter over me, you don't deserve me. If you don't go all the way with me through thick and thin, you don't deserve me. If your first concern is to look after yourself, you'll never find yourself. But if you forget about yourself and look to me, you'll find both yourself and me. And for anyone listening, I can promise you from personal experience what, that what I just read is so absolutely true. I promise you. I'll read it again. But if you forget about yourself and look to me, you'll find both yourself and me. It's amazing Ooh. how that happens. <clears throat> we are intimately linked in this harvest work. Anyone who accepts what you do accepts me, the one who sent you. Anyone who accepts what I do accepts my Father who sent me. Accepting a messenger of God is as good as being God's messenger. Accepting someone's help is as good as giving someone help. This is a large work I've called you into, but don't be overwhelmed by it. It's best to start small. Give a cool cup of water to someone who is thirsty, for instance. The smallest act of giving or receiving makes you a true apprentice. You won't lose out on a thing. I love that he starts out with, just give someone a cool drink of water. 
What a great way to show I care about you. He's trying to tell them, I'm not telling you to live your life preaching at people. Right. You don't have to go out on a street corner with a sign that tells people about their damnation and everything else. Shouting on the street corners and making a spectacle and, but not showing any love. Yeah. It just seems that in doing this reading, I cannot escape the fact that we are called to live out a life of love, not towards ourself, but we need to love outside of ourself. And that's what Jesus is telling us. He's not suggesting it. He's telling us this is what we have to do. Time to get off some soapboxes and time to start rolling sleeves up and get dirty and really help people. Put Does some it? action behind your faith, yeah. right? Go to where they are. And now I'll be reading out of Acts, and we're in chapter 15, verse 22, to the end of the chapter. So everyone agreed, apostles, leaders, all of the people. They picked Judas, nicknamed Barsabas, and Silas. They both carried considerable weight in the church and sent them to Antioch with Paul and Barnabas with this letter. From the apostles and leaders, your friends, to our friends in Antioch, Syria, and Sicilia. Hello. We have heard that some men from our church went to you and said things that confused and upset you. Mind you, they had no authority from us. We didn't send them. We have agreed unanimously to pick representatives and send them to you with our good friends Barnabas and Paul. We picked men that we knew you could trust. Judas and Silas, they've looked death in the face time and again for the sake of our master, Jesus Christ. We've sent them to confirm in a face-to-face meeting with you what we've written. It seemed to the Holy Spirit and to us that you should not be saddled with any crushing burden, but be responsible only for these bare necessities. Be careful not to get involved in activities connected with idols. Avoid serving food that's offensive to Jewish Christians, blood, for instance, and guard the morality of sex and marriage. These guidelines are sufficient to keep relations congenial between us, and God be with you. And so, off they went to Antioch. On arrival, they gathered the church and read the letter. The people were greatly relieved and pleased. Judas and Silas, good preachers, both of them, strengthened their new friends with many words of courage and hope. Then it was time to go home. They were sent off by their new friends with laughter and embraces all around to report back to those who had sent them. Paul and Barnabas stayed on in Antioch, preaching and teaching the word of God, but they weren't alone. There were a number of teachers and preachers at that time in Antioch. After a few days of this, Paul said to Barnabas, Let's go back and visit all of our friends in each of the towns where we preach the word of God. Let's see how they're doing. Barnabas wanted to take John along, the John nicknamed Mark. But Paul wouldn't have him. He wasn't about to take along a quitter who, as soon as the going got tough, had jumped ship on them in Pamphylia. Tempers flared and they ended up going their separate ways. Barnabas took Mark and sailed for Cyprus. And Paul chose Silas, and offered up by their friends to the grace of the master, went to Syria and Sicilia to put grit in those congregations. I love that. He, putting grit in the congregations, you know, it's yeah. like giving them some meat with their potatoes. or <laughs> yeah. yeah, yeah, that's a good Paul thing. But do you know what I really appreciate? Barnabas, the encourager. Okay, you don't want the quitter? I do. Let me pour into him and build him up and encourage him to keep going. I love Barnabas. I mean, that's what his name Mm -hmm. means. Yes. And that's what he did. Paul, on the other hand, he ain't got no time for that. He is gung-ho, get out of the way, bull in a china shop, (laughs) all or nothing. And that's him. And they're needed in the church, too. But I love that that was included because I think it's a good reminder. Don't exclude the people who are struggling. And people like Barnabas were there to make sure they weren't. And to encourage them, absolutely. Written off and just sent out of the way. Because 
uh, Barnabas took Mark and the fact that Barnabas took him, it showed, you know, he was, he still had a lot of value. and Oh, um, he absolutely yeah. Yeah. did. Right. But Paul but it was, just was a not willing to make allowances for that. And that's a flaw in Paul. Mm. It's not, I don't believe Paul is completely right in his mentality towards people. You have to love and you have to care. And starting fights and screaming and arguing does not help the cause of Jesus. I have, I believe Barnabas mm. kind of threw that out. The other thing that I found interesting was it mentioned um, like don't eat food that's offensive to Jewish Christians. Sure. It's not told to them because they're the weak Christians. The Jewish Christians are weak in that, in that they're offended by the eating of certain foods. They're still in that mindset because this is new. They can eat it all. None of that matters. So it's not mm. saying that food is bad. Sure. It is wrong and you're supposed to be like them. It's saying they're weak in their faith yet. So in order not to cause an issue for their sake, just don't eat that when you're with them. Got it. And now we'll be rewinding back to the Old Testament, and Heidi's going to pick up at Psalms chapter 24. All right, let's see what David has to say about God today. Psalm 24, God claims earth and everything in it. God claims world and all who live on it. He built it on ocean foundations, laid it out on river girders. Who can scale Mount God? Who can scale the holy north face? Only the clean-handed, only the pure-hearted. Men who won't cheat, women who won't seduce. God is at their side. With God's help, they make it. This, Jacob, is what happens to God-seekers, God-questers. Wake up, you sleepyhead city. Wake up, you sleepyhead people. King Glory is ready to enter. Who is this King Glory? God, armed and battle-ready. Wake up, you sleepyhead city. Wake up, you sleepyhead people. King Glory is ready to enter. Who is this King Glory? God of the angel armies. He is King Glory. I love how mm -hmm. they show the different names of God. Yes. And, you know, God of the angel armies is one that I've always loved. Mm -hmm. It's very... You do it's, get a visual. You do get a visual of like this commander that's in the front of this huge company of angels oh, that are warriors. just warrior angels that are ready to go to battle. And he is there commanding them. I mean, I love, yeah, every time I hear I God know. of the angel armies, I always love it. It is, I, I know, I love it. But David also is trying to get people to wake up and see. So before we get into Exodus, I'm just going to read the preface to Exodus just to kind of give you an idea of what this book is all about. And this is from Eugene Peterson here. So the human race is in trouble. We've been in trouble for a long time. Enormous energies have been and continue to be expended by many, many men and women to get us out of the trouble that we're in, to clean up the world's mess. The skill, the perseverance, the intelligence, the devotion of the people who put their shoulders to the wheel to pull us out of the muck, parents and teachers, healers and counselors, rulers, politicians, writers and pastors, it is impressive. At the center and core of this work is God. The most comprehensive term for what God is doing to get us out of the mess that we're in is salvation. Salvation is God doing for us what we can't do for ourselves. Salvation is the biggest word in the vocabulary of the people of God. The story of the Exodus is a powerful and dramatic and true story of God working salvation. The story has generated an extraordinary progeny through the centuries, reproducing itself in song and poem, drama and novel, politics and social justice, repentance and conversion, and worship and holy living. It continues to capture the imaginations of men, women, and especially men and women that are in trouble. It is significant that God does not present us with salvation in the form of an abstract truth or a precise definition or a catchy slogan, but as a story. Exodus draws us into a story with plot and characters 
which is to say with design and personal relationships. Story is an invitation to participate, first through our imaginations and then, if we will, by faith with our total lives in response to God. This Exodus story continues to be a major means that God uses to draw men and women in trouble out of the mess of history into the kingdom of salvation. About half the book, chapters 1 through 19 and 32 through 34, is a gripping narrative of an obscure and severely brutalized people who are saved out of slavery and into a life of freedom. The other half, chapters 20 to 31 and 35 through 40, is meticulous. Some think tedious. Basic instruction and training in living the saved mm. free life. The story of salvation is not complete without both halves. We talked about this in one of my lectures at school. I know okay. I bring that up yeah. quite a bit. And we do often see it as just so tedious. And some of these laws, it's like some of them seem ridiculous. They make no sense. And I understand in the context of our culture that they do not. What we need to understand at the time that all of these are given to them, this is setting them apart. And they're going to look really different than the norms go going on. As bad as we may feel some of these are in the context right. of today. Yes. They are worlds better in such a vast improvement to the norms of the cultures in that time. God literally was lifting them above this ugliness that typically was centered on devoted religious belief in these pagan gods and horrible, horrible things were lawlessness kind of ran the show. It was needed for God's people to have good foundations. And that's why this is included in the Old Testament. And it makes me a lot more excited to get into them because trust me, I used to dread it. <laughs> I didn't read numbers and yeah. I didn't read all the laws. So. <laughs> <laughs> and we'll be reading today Exodus 1 through 3. And we got some names, so buckle up. Yes. These are the names of the Israelites who went to Egypt with Jacob, each bringing his family members. Reuben, Simeon, Levi, and Judah, Issachar, Zebulun, and Benjamin, Dan and Naphtali, Gad and Asher, seventy persons in all generated by Jacob's seed. Joseph was already in Egypt. Then Joseph died, and all of his brothers, that whole generation. But the children of Israel kept on reproducing. They were very prolific, a population explosion in their own right and the land was filled with them. It's remarkable considering they were brutalized in slavery. I mean, they were worked before morning yes. to after dark, and literally a lot of it was done to try and keep them from having more <laughs> children. That didn't work. <laughs> a new king came to power in Egypt who didn't know Joseph. He spoke to his people with alarm. There are way too many of these Israelites for us to handle. We've got to do something. Let's devise a plan to contain them, lest if there's a war, they should join our enemies or just walk off and leave us. So they organized them into work gangs and put them into hard labor under gang foremen. They built the storage cities Python and Ramses for Pharaoh. But the harder the Egyptians worked them, the more children the Israelites had. Children were everywhere. <laughs> The Egyptians got so they couldn't stand the Israelites and treated them worse than ever, crushing them with slave labor. They made them miserable with hard labor, making bricks and mortar and backbreaking work in the fields. They piled on the work, crushing them under the cruel workload. The king of Egypt had a talk with the two Hebrew midwives. One was named Shipra and the other was named Pua. He said, when you deliver the Hebrew women, Look at the sex of the baby. If it's a boy, kill him. If it's a girl, let her live. But the midwives had far too much respect for God and didn't do what the king of Egypt had ordered. They let the boy babies live. The king of Egypt called in the midwives. Why didn't you obey my orders? You've let those babies live. The midwives answered Pharaoh. The Hebrew women are like the Egyptian women. They are vigorous. Before the midwife can get there, they've already had the baby. 
God was pleased with the midwives. The people continued to increase in number, a very strong people. And because the midwives honored God, God gave them families of their own. So Pharaoh issued a general order to all of his people. Every boy that is born, drown him in the Nile, but let the girls live. I loved that God paid attention to these women and said, I'm going to give you a family now. Someone, these women normally didn't have families. So that, no. Their job was to deliver babies. Yeah. And, Lisa and be, Harper talked about this okay. in one of her recent podcasts, and she just loved Shifra and Pua, the Hebrew midwives, and their willingness to potentially sacrifice their lives to disobey the king, literally, because they lied. They, yeah. they didn't have these babies before they got there. A man from the family of Levi married a Levite woman. The woman became pregnant and had a son. She saw that there was something special about him and hid him. She hid him for three months. When she couldn't hide him any longer, she got a little basket boat made of papyrus, waterproofed it with tar and pitch, and placed the child in it. Then she set it afloat in the reeds at the edge of the Nile. The baby's older sister found herself a vantage point a little way off and watched to see what would happen to him. Pharaoh's daughter came down to the Nile to bathe. Her maiden strolled on the bank. She saw the basket floating in the reeds and sent her maid to get it. She opened it and saw the child, a baby crying. Mm. Her heart went out to him. She said, this must be one of the Hebrew babies. Then his sister was before her. Do you want me to go and get a nursing mother from the Hebrews so that she can nurse the baby for you? Pharaoh's daughter said, yes, go. The girl went and called the child's mother. Pharaoh's daughter told her, take this baby and nurse him for me. I'll pay you. The woman took the child and nursed him. After the child was weaned, she presented him to Pharaoh's daughter who adopted him as her son. She named him Moses meaning pulled out, saying, I pulled him out of the water. Time passed. Moses grew up. One day he went and saw his brothers, saw all that hard labor. Then he saw an Egyptian hit a Hebrew, one of his relatives. He looked this way and then that, and when he realized there was no one in sight, he killed that Egyptian and buried him in the sand. The next day he went out there again. Two Hebrew men were fighting. He spoke to the man who started it. Why are you hitting your neighbor? The man shot back. Who do you think you are telling us what to do? Are you going to kill me the same way you killed that Egyptian? Then Moses panicked. Word's gotten out. People know about this. Pharaoh heard about it and tried to kill Moses, but Moses got away to the land of Midian. He sat down by a well. The priest of Midian had seven daughters. They came and drew water, filling the troughs and watering their father's sheep. When some shepherds came and chased the girls off, Moses came to their rescue and helped them water their sheep. When they got home to their father, Rule, he said, That didn't take long. Why are you back so soon? An Egyptian, they said, rescued us from a bunch of shepherds. Why, he even drew water for us and watered the sheep. He said, So where is he? Why did you leave him behind? Invite him here so that he can have something to eat with us. Moses agreed to settle down there with the man, who then gave his daughter Zipporah, which means bird, to him for his wife. She had a son, and Moses named him Gershom, sojourner, saying, I'm a sojourner in a foreign country. Many years later, the king of Egypt died. The Israelites groaned under their slavery and cried out, their cries for relief from their hard labor ascended to God. God listened to their groanings. God remembered his covenant with Abraham, with Isaac, and with Jacob. God saw what was going on with Israel. God understood. Moses was shepherding the flock of Jethro, his father-in-law, the priest of Midian. He led the flock to the west end of the wilderness and came to the mountain of God, Horeb. The angel of God appeared to him in flames of fire, blazing out of the middle of a bush. He looked. The bush was blazing away, but it didn't burn up. Moses said, what's going on here? I can't believe this. This is amazing. 
Why doesn't the bush burn up? God saw that he had stopped to look, and then God called out to him from out of the bush, Moses, Moses. He said, yes, I'm right here. God said, don't come any closer. Remove your sandals from your feet. You are standing on holy ground. Then he said, I am the God of your father, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, the God of Jacob. Moses hid his face, afraid to look at God. God said, I've taken a good long look at the affliction of my people in Egypt. I've heard their cries for deliverance from their slave masters. I know all about their pain. And now I've come down to help them, pry them loose from the grip of Egypt, get them out of that country and bring them to a good land with wide open spaces, a land lush with milk and honey, the land of the Canaanite, the Hittite, the Amorite, the Perizzite, the Hivite, and the Jebusite. The Israelite cry for help has come to me, and I've seen for myself how cruelly they're being treated by the Egyptians. It's time for you to go back. I'm sending you to Pharaoh to bring my people, the people of Israel, out of Egypt. Moses answered God, Uh, but why me? What makes you think that I could ever go to Pharaoh and lead the children of Israel out of Egypt? One moment, too afraid to look at God. The next, you're just saying, God, I think you made a mistake. Yeah, I, yeah, I think no. you dialed the wrong number yeah. in that bush no. there. I, I'm busy with my sheep. Yeah. I'll be with you, God said, and this will be the proof that I am the one who sent you. When you have brought my people out of Egypt, you will worship God right here at this very mountain. Then Moses said to God, But suppose I go to the people of Israel and I tell them, You know, the God of your father sent me to you, and they ask me, Well, what is his name? What do I tell them? God said to Moses, I am who I am. Tell the people of Israel, I am sent me to you. God continued with Moses, This is what you're to say to the Israelites. God, the God of your fathers, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob sent me to you. This has always been my name, and this is how I will always be known. Now be on your way. Gather the leaders of Israel. Tell them, God, the God of your fathers, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob appeared to me, saying, I've looked into what's being done to you in Egypt and I've determined to get you out of the affliction of Egypt and take you to the land of the Canaanite, the Hittite, the Amorite, the Perizzite, the Hivite, and the Jebusite, a land that is brimming over with milk and honey. Believe me, they will listen to you. Then you and the leaders of Israel will go to the king of Egypt and say to him, God, the God of the Hebrews, has met with us. Let us take a three-day journey into the wilderness where we will worship God, our God. I know that the king of Egypt won't let you go unless forced to, so I'll intervene and hit Egypt where it hurts. Oh, my miracles will send them reeling, after which they'll be glad to send you off. I'll see to it that this people get a hearty send-off by the Egyptians. When you leave, you won't leave empty-handed. Each woman will ask her neighbor and any guest in her house for objects of silver and gold, for jewelry and extra clothes, and you'll put them on your sons and daughters. Oh, you will clean the Egyptians out. And that, man, that's the end of uh, chapter three in Exodus, but wow. We're off I mean, to a start. It just, it did not wait. And already we have a foolish man arguing with God. And God is so patient. Hey. He could like crush them, squash them, send fire, say, forget you. I will find somebody that's eager to listen to me. But no, he's endlessly patient. So patient with us. Oh, I'm thankful. And we are happy that God is patient with us. Oh, as Lord we, knows that I need patience. Because we are continually under this refining. I don't yes. think we've ever arrived, but we continually refine ourselves. Yes. And part of going through this journey through the message, it's refining. Yes. 
And yes. so our whole intent is just to get you one step closer to God. Uh, if, if what we're reading and talking about opens your eyes to something or helps you out in some way and encourages you to get inside the Bible, that's a beautiful thing and a win in our book. Absolutely. I have found that God has brought me to the greatest conviction while reading this Bible, but I have never felt as if he's punishing me or angry with me. It's such love. It's conviction without the guilt. Absolutely. It's kind of like a diet soda. Oh, but that's not for you. <laughs> Oh, I'm I know I'm not so comparing hard. the Bible to a diet yes, soda. <laughs> please, no, no, it's a uh, conviction is not always an easy thing to face, especially when somebody is very bluntly convicting you in hard areas. But yep. man, he's got it covered with love and it makes you joyful to try to do what he asks you to do. Yeah. Just knowing the whole time that no matter what, he just loves you. So rest secure in that. Yes. And thanks again for joining along with us on this journey through the message. We are so happy to have you along with us and in doing this little thing called life with us. Woo, yes. And we look forward to seeing you next time. See you next time, everyone.